my name is Emmanuel Dibaba. I don't know how much you have heard from what UL was trying to present. Uh, I am the country director for PAC in Ethiopia and also and also uh, working as a Horn of Africa cluster lead for PAC in Ethiopia here. Um, today we'll be talking about our experience of piloting the conflict early warning and rapid response upgraded and reformed system in Ethiopia. Uh, my part would be focusing, next slide please. My, my, the presentation would have three sections and my part would be dealing with the, the first section. Uh, moderator, the next slide, please. Yes, the overall, the, the, the overall background and, and the startup of the piloting phase of SWARE will be discussed. Um, when we designed the conflict early warning rapid response program in Ethiopia, it started by gaining experiences on the existing systems. We did not start from the scratch. Ethiopia already had a conflict early warning rapid response system. We wanted to take the existing system to the next level. We upgraded and, and reformed it in such a way that technology was introduced, new documentations, guidelines, and um, standard operating procedures were developed, as well as staff were trained and deployed. But in doing so, we made sure that we took the local context into consideration, as well as we built on on the available resources. When I say resources, these are like the traditional structures that, that exist in place, the power situation, which made us to think of a power backup system as we designed the program and so forth. This program had a design development as well as pilot and a scale up phase. Next slide, please. So um, what does this system address? This system was designed based on an assessment conducted by PACT and the Zen Ministry of uh, Personalist and Federal Affairs, MOFDA, to look into the existing conflict early warning rapid system, rapid response system in Ethiopia. And when that assessment was done, uh, 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 the result came up with some of the gaps that existed in, in the existing system. So when Sewer was introduced, it improved the data quality. That means early warning data were starting to be shared timely, accurately, and with complete information. It also brought in an issue of account accountability because everything was systematically recorded in a digital way. Documentation was also one of the gap, which was addressed by the upgraded SWELL system. It also created a standard operating procedure on how to respond, report and respond to conflict across the different regions and the federal governments of Ethiopia. It brought in an opportunity 
for engaging the community into conflict management and stabilization. More importantly, it was also implemented with the joint collaboration of the federal government of Ethiopia, as well as the regional government and the local community. So the engagement was improved. The participatory approach was uh, enhanced at all level. Next slide, please. What do we mean when we say we collect early warning information data? We collect incidents and signals. These incidents and signals are collected from open media, from field monitors who are collecting incidents and signals from the community. People can also call in. They can also send in SMS. All this information will be collected on incidents and signals. These are used to prevent and, re and, and reduce violent conflicts because the early warning would help an early action uh, uh, through a joint partnership with which my colleague Nicholas will discuss. In addition, we are also collecting situation information. The situation data is all about community perception on governance, on economy, on peace and security, on environment, on all sorts of things. This also helps to inform sustainable solution, policymakers, government executives, and as well as informal structures, religious leaders, elders, abagadas in, in Ethiopia here, the Ugazis would be able to get the information and through the steering committee, respond properly to the needs both in the long and short term. Next slide. What are the distinct features of the sewer system we piloted in Ethiopia? One, it uses a verified data. The information comes from the source, from the grassroots, from the community. And it also uses a bottom-up approach. From time to time, we use a top-down approach, which means when informations are coming from media sources, from open sources, we tag them and we send them down to the grassroots for verification. So we use bottom-up approach, verified data source, but the unique future of the Ethiopian sewer system is the government and community collaboration, the partnership aspect. I normally mention this in all my presentation and I want to end it with that. Our sewer system piloted in Ethiopia is a platform which allowed citizens and government to work collaboratively towards st stability, peace, and security. Thank you very much. My colleague Negis would, would take on the next session. Thank you for your attention. Can you hear me? Thank you, Emmanuel. Hello, everyone. I'll proceed with the partnership model that we adopted for the rapid response action. Next slide. So our partnership model uh, holds the idea that uh, the idea and the process that brought the public designated peace uh, structure of the government and multiple responses institution to collaboratively prevent violent violent conflict and uh, potential for escalation this model uses multi sourced verified uh, conflict early warning data to formulate response actions and also it's multi layered the response operation guided by response actors that are at different level it also revitalized the local Peace Committee at grassroots level and community participation. And also it's follow uh, bottom-up approach. It makes changes in how response actor collaborate, coordinate, implement 
their conflict rapid response roles and responsibilities. Next slide. It's also a facilitate for solid and succession decision making a process uh, among response actors at, and creates roadmap and clearly defined uh, roles and responsibilities. Awareness rate is basically uh, intended to ensure active participation of the community and effective management of the sewer system. The awareness activity uh, targeted uh, administrative authorities, communities, and uh, the public in general where the sewer piloting being rolling out. This also this partnership model also adopted and adhered to these basic principles. This is inclusive gender sensitivity, timeliness, transparency, neutrality, legality, and do not our principles in general. Uh, in the inclusive part, all the affected communities' voice should be heard. Women's participation also enhanced in this process. Every process should be, response act activity should be on timely manner and transparency should be every art, response action articulated and shared with the community also part of the whole process the next slide so in the, in doing this uh, this model uh, in this model we have grouped we have a group of uh, committees the first one is a steering committee which is a response actors comprised this response institutions and customer institutions this committee is formed from federal to Wereda level administrative structures and include both the customary and uh, formal response institutions. The committee, the committee is chaired by uh, head of administrative unit, and these committee members are responsible for reviewing uh, early warning information and plan for the appropriate early response. The other uh, co committee. Sorry, back to the first slide. The other committee, back to the first slide, first slide about response actors. The response actors, the other response actors are local peace committees. These are largely molded and anchored on the customary institution of the community and collaboratively work with Kabale level response institution level. And these communities, uh, these committees are aiming at encouraging the community and facilitating the collection of conflict early warning information, providing rapid response, and also supporting peace building process within their local context through participation of the customary leaders, youth, and women. Next slide. So this partnership model has followed a different stage, uh, which, has, uh, which are about four stages. The first one is preparatory stage, uh, which aimed at defining the purpose and what uh, really needed in this partnership was clearly defined, then setting up uh, that focuses on building relationship and uh, development of agreement among the partners. Uh, the next stage was managing the, the conflict rapid response works, which enabled the response actors jointly analyze the conflict cases plan, respond and monitor the effectiveness of the process and sustaining the partnership. Next slide. So the next slide. The partnership follows, it has its own framework uh, that, is, that is your information analysis, uh, response planning, implementation, monitoring, and reporting. So in doing that, the response actor receive 
uh, information from uh, peace and security structure. The conflict early warning and rapid response expert analyze the information, evaluate, assign grading and drafting uh, response recommendation. Then the head review the analysis and the recommendation. Upon the finalization of this analysis, it will be transmitted to response actors through the peace and security structure head. The peace and security structure head convene a meeting with the response actors. Then they, the response actors together determine whether responding to the reported case, if the, the response issue is under their mandate and having the, the capacity to respond for the cases. So if the report case is uh, under their mandate and they have the capacity to respond, immediately agree on the most appropriate response intervention and develop intent, notify the next higher level and respond uh, accordingly. If they don't have the capacity and the, the mandate, they will request assist, assistance to the next higher level. Next slide. Uh, based on this partnership model, for example, in sewer projects, uh, which was piloted uh, recently, uh, there were 166 cases reported. Among the cases reported, uh, about 96 cases were closed at local level, at grassroots level, which means at village and Wereda level. Uh, after the completion, the response actor evaluates the effectiveness of the response and they categorize as effective and ineffective or moderately effective. Next slide. Generally, what this partnership model benefits in terms of fastening the response action, timely response, it also facilitated the participatory decision-making process, it shared the leadership, and also facilitate the inter intra community communication, open opportunity for competency and learning. It shares value among the, the committees in terms of ac being accountable, integrity, and trust, and clarified purpose for the community. I have done with my presentation. I will pass. I will pass the floor to Dr. Abdi from Ministry of Peace. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Team Pact uh, has made a, a wonderful presentation, a very comprehensive presentation. I hope you all uh, hear me now. Uh, thank you very much. It's really uh, uh, interesting presentation, uh, supported with an informed data and everything. Uh, this is Abdi uh, from the Ministry of Peace, and as most of you may know, the Ministry is responsible for overseeing much of the. Uh, there are a lot of different agencies, but the Ministry is responsible in overseeing and ensuring uh, the security of citizens. Uh, uh, as you have. Uh, heard from the presentation, the technical presentation by the PAC team, uh, the government of Ethiopia has been enhancing its collaboration with the civil society in order to address uh, many uh, gaps across the country. And one of the areas is conflict resolution, of course. Uh, 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 Ethiopia, as you know, very well, is a country in a transition period. And this transition is a determined transition towards establishing a consolidated democracy. We had a semi-authoritarian or authoritarian government, whichever way we, you like to call it. Now the country embarked upon because of a huge demand from the public uh, uh, toward this building uh, democracy. And this requires responding to the public need in a comprehensive manner. And uh, one of the priority areas of this reform process, this is a multifaceted comprehensive reform process Ethiopia entered into in managing this transition period, which touched upon the cultural, social, economic, political, of course, also security reform is one of the priorities. And the security reform has been very much uh, the top priority of the government. And the security reform as a whole, the security apparatus need to experience 
uh, a paradigm shift first and uh, mostly. And this paradigm shift is from regime-centered uh, security narrative towards a human-centered, citizen-centered security narrative. And this uh, paradigm shift has been very critical because the country has a long tradition of authoritarian and semi-authoritarian systems where the security apparatus prioritized the security of regimes and individuals But now we are shifting towards uh, uh, the different object of making the different object of security the citizens. And to do this, we need to have uh, strong institutions that can deliver and reach to, to, to the society at all levels. And at this particular time, especially the government's capability to address all the security needs and you know, to uh, uh, get support in, in realizing the security needs of the nation uh, uh, requires support from responsible, uh, uh, trusted uh, organizations like PACT. And we have been working uh, very closely for the last uh, three years. And we have completed the uh, first phase of the uh, pilot process. Now we are in the process of scaling up. And this is done through a very strong partnership. And as you know, the, in the previous time, the Ethiopian security priority have been you know, revolving around incident-based response to security problems, but this has to be Hello, I'm back, I think, yes. Uh, I will follow up from where I stopped earlier. So uh, identifying areas of collaboration has been very much crucial. And as you have heard from the presentation, uh, uh, utilizing the social capital, both in identifying and alerting the presence of uh, security threats and as well as bringing about a lasting solution has been the utmost priority. And these are the areas, one of the important areas we have been collaborating and why we forged also this partnership. In addition to that, we find the PAC system, the sewer system very important. And why we are working together is because it's adamant position in modernizing the early warning system at large. Uh, the ministry has uh, general director level uh, early warning system uh, you know, office, which oversees this. So this has to be a, 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 a managed in, 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 a, in a, a systematic manner that both incorporate the aspects of the social capital, cultural capitals, and with the modernization. That will give us a capability to be much more proactive and bringing about also elastic solution rather than a band-aid solution to uh, the problems we experience. So the, this important issues where we need the need to uh, proactively take measures and the importance of uh, respecting the cultural values and using the social capital to address these problems are the most important areas where we uh, find a common point, an intersection point to work with the PACT team. And in, in addition to that, one of the interesting things we have observed in this piloting process is how much it is important uh, genuine democracy, authentic democracy in the empowerment of citizens. As we have seen from the data, much of the problems are resolved at a local level. And this has been very crucial. And this is a great lesson for a country that is trying to transit uh, in a smooth manner as much as possible toward this uh, democracy. The scaling up of the PACT program definitely will help us uh, uh, address issues before they erupt into violent conflict. And at the same time, it will enable us, especially the data collection, and the uh, matters related to it will enable us also to find a lasting solution to address uh, problems in a different parts of Ethiopia. So this is an integral part of the peace, peace building process where we utilize people-centered approach, where we uh, 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 prioritize the cultural ethos, 
the social capital and other things, and we aspire to uh, ensure the empowerment of citizens. Above all, all of these things we believe can be achieved in a partnership. A partnership with civil society is a crucial element. As most of you may recall, the civil society just started to function in a number of areas. There has been, you know, there used to be a lot that uh, bars uh, civil society organizations in supporting the government in such areas. But now I think PACT is proving itself a very important partner in realizing one of the priorities of the government of Ethiopia, as well as citizens. Uh, across different parts of the nation, where we the collaboration will benefit and enable us to ensure the country's utmost priority, uh, that is security and addressing the security gaps in collaboration with the part in collaboration with PACT. And I, I think I will wrap up with this. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to share uh, our thoughts and how the partnership is forged with this very important civil society that we are working with. Uh, I appreciate for giving me the chance to relate to you, the Ethiopian government position and uh, uh, angle in this uh, partnership. Thank you. Um, we we are having we are having some technical glitches with EUL. So I'm, I'm stepping in to open the floor for questions and we'll, we'll try to, we'll attempt to answer any possible questions you might have between the three presenters. Thank you very much, all our presenters, including myself, of course. Thank you very much, presenters. Uh, is it possible to continue? Please. Okay, I'm, I'm Yared uh, Hurisa. I am working on um, uh, conflict model from um, uh, in Eastern African region with um, projects in USAID funded projects. Um, recently, we are looking into uh, a situation where we can uh, model conflict, uh, where we can forecast conflict in the future, like one year ahead of time. So this is uh, like for Ethiopia and um, we uh, kind of succeeded on the project. So I see that uh, this kind of initiative fits into your um, uh, presentation today because I would see uh, you are building a system where uh, you can uh, get information as soon as possible from the ground up to the higher level and respond accordingly. Uh, now, the thing is, when we add forecasting in, in this process, it would give us a chance to identify hotspot areas early on before even uh, happening the, the conflict incidents. So this is just to say that what is going on in terms of um, identifying hotspot areas before happening. Now, what I understood from your presentation is this is an information system where you would gather incidences as soon as possible. But what, uh, what, what else can be done in terms of uh, identifying hotspot areas? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think just, just to attempt very quickly and briefly to give an option for, for other participants, this is now at a, at a pilot phase, trying to collect signal and incident information and respond as quickly as possible. But in the long term, the data will be used to determine trends because they will be gathered and analyzed systematically and historical data, when, when they mature enough, when we gather enough data, will be used to predict and prepare any potential conflicts. At this stage, uh, because of the few number of cases we have gathered within the limited period we have for piloting this program, we are not in a position to use the data we have to do any sort of pre prediction. But I would also agree with you in that uh, 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 modeling would 
be one tool and approach that would help us even be more proactive in terms of preventing conflicts. So as we continue with the scale up and as we continue to gather more data, we can use them and adopt them to the different prediction and prevention models so that our early learning system is more robust in terms of meeting our needs, I would say at this stage. Any other question? And I'll, I'll leave the floor to, to other presenters also to answer. Just to add on the prediction, we already have the situational data uh, collection, which is uh, basically informed us about the perception of the community. This information is uh, used to uh, predict the grievance, the opinion of the community that really being uh, an issue or as a cause of conflict in any uh, given context. So having this information, we have uh, also uh, determined the analysis uh, part, which includes the prediction, as Emmanuel said, it will be, you know, have like historical data for a given period of time, not for this short period of time. Uh, hello all. Uh, my name is uh, Mella Brinkman from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. And um, I know quite a few of you because uh, we um, proudly fund this uh, project. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and I really have to uh, salute you in uh, what you um, presented and uh, what you uh, established together with the Ministry of Peace. Um, this is also something we very much like, the, col the collaboration between Pact, the Ministry of Peace, uh, but also the local communities. And I really like this, uh, this bottom-up approach. Um, my question relates a little bit uh, to um, what has been asked uh, of earlier by um, um, Arthur Page in the first session, of Miss um, Page in the first session. Um, and that is, how does it translate into action? And um, you referred to it uh, briefly uh, in uh, in your presentation. But um, how does those how do those early warnings translate into actions? And what kind of actions? Um, um, yeah, uh, can you maybe give an example of? Um, so I'm, I'm I'm really interested in that part. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. I'll, I'll have the first crack on it, and then next would would add briefly on, onto that. Before our moderator. Uh, had uh, a technical glitch. It was our plan to conclude this uh, presentation by acknowledging all our donors, the European Union, the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs, and the USID, and also the Ministry of Peace for the in-kind contributions they have made to the success of this project. But the moderator is having a connectivity problem. So um, acknowledging early in the session on behalf of him. But now to, to go and answer the question asked by, by Mele, Whenever a case is reported, a case file would be opened and that case file would be well analyzed and presented to the steering committee, who are the rapid response steering committees. The steering committee includes both state and non-state actors, officials from the police, from administration, as well as religious leaders, traditional leaders, civil society representatives who will be sitting in the steering committee. That makes sure that there is a check and balance between the way the action is designed and implemented. Now, when that action is decided, the intent to respond is captured in the system so that the higher level response actors can also see and say, this is okay to proceed. And, and after that, that response would be implemented by, a resp by the responsible person. It could be a traditional arbitration. It could be an involvement of the, the, the legal and security system at work, but the decision on how, what kind of response should be uh, 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 made is, is, is the mandate of the state and non-state actor combined steering committee. And after that, 
the response will also be re reported in a way that they rate how fast, how effective, how diligent, and how transparent it has been implemented. And it is at that stage that that case would be closed, only archived for future reference. Have I missed anything, Negis? You can add briefly. I think you already said it. For the sake of time, it's better to. I have a quick question. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, I had, I guess, quite a specific question on, you mentioned the, the multi-source verification of information. So I was just interested in, in your process of verifying the data. And in particular, did you experience any issues with misinformation and disinformation? Thank you. My colleague needs to probably take this and I would add, we only are left with a minute, I guess, but we, Nikis will briefly attempt to respond to this question. Yes. Uh, from the, the conflict early warning information collected by field monitors, and also there is a media monitoring. There is Is also so so Sorry, I was lost. Can, can you hear me? Yes, you are back again. Please proceed. So this information sent back to the field monitor in collaboration with the Kabale level administrative body and the community representative, they verify whether the information is true or not. If the information is true, the information back to the peace and security structure, which is signed by the Kabali administration body, so that the analysis will be held at uh, uh, peace and security structures. This, so after analyzing all the issue, this information sent back to uh, response actors. Again, these response actors will evaluate whether the information is correct. And again, if the issue is under their mandate, uh, if they have the capacity. If all the analysis issues are well addressed, they will design or plan for the possible action. Thank you. And just to just to add to what Nikis has said, thank you very much, Nikis. I guess with the issue of disinformation, misinformation, we do have two approach to, to tackle that. The one, the information that is flowing from bottom up is information from the real source, from the community, by, by the field monitors, and is vetted by the administrative structure to make sure that it, it is as accurate as possible before it is captured in the system. The information that we get from the open source, from media and, and, and both mainstream and, and social media are not acted upon until we tag them. We tag them means we take that information, we send it down to a local wherever or zone or region where it has been reported from to make sure that the local structure verifies whether that information is true or not. Once they said it is indeed correct that this has happened in the region, it will use them to prepare a response action. So they will establish their intent, open a case file for response, and it goes on like that. I hope we have attempted to answer your question. Thank you very much, Mr. Emmanuel. Also very happy 
that the moderator, the technical moderator has given us a few more minutes for question and answer. So we'll, we'll take one or one or two questions in addition. Nicole, do you want to say something or can I take the floor? Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Um, hi, this is Nicole Wittersheim. I'm Senior Policy Advisor at the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Um, and, um, you know, congratulations on all the work on these systems. Um, I, I just wanted to understand in light of what, what is happening and what has been happening in the last six months in Ethiopia, where what I, I just I don't understand where a very um, complex and it looks like um, well thought out system that you're describing for us here today what what happened with regards to uh, the violence um, and the early warning in Tigray and you know how 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 is this being applied to other hot spots right now in real time in Ethiopia thank you um, I would, I would uh, give a say uh, to, to, do, to Dr. Rabbi on this, but remember uh, the sewer project was piloted in Oromia, in southern regional states and in Gambela and not, not in Tigre. And uh, in our belief in the regions where we are um, um, piloting the sewer system, the situation data we collect, the situation analysis that we, we conduct on monthly basis through our field monitors, that gathers the public perception on uh, governance, on, on uh, I would say economy, on environment, and all that would give some heads up some early information to policymakers, decision makers to start to be thinking on escalating if there is any tension. The conflict in Tigray is probably beyond the scope of my uh, uh, answer uh, here, but Dr. Abi, if that really is a, a, a relevant topic for us to discuss here, can comment, but I feel that that is a more broader political issue where law and the order was supposed to be maintained in, 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 in that region by the government. Dr. Abdi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Emanuel, and also for the question uh, uh, respected uh, Amandi uh, raised about the, uh, uh, the situation in the region. Uh, I think this is a, the, the important thing. I think it follows up with the earlier question raised by Alex, I believe uh, that's connected to the misinformation and the misunderstanding of the context at large. As I said earlier at the beginning of my talk, Ethiopia is in a transition process. And this transition is a dismantling of the pre-existing authoritarian system, which were dominated by the Tigray People's Liberation Front a movement uh, that uh, hijacked the region and it was a liberation uh, long overdue. What happened actually, we call it a law enforcement operation to liberate the region from a narcissistic, totalitarian uh, group, uh, which is uh, very much induced with nostalgia. And there was a lot of begging and an attempt by religious leaders, by the different institutions, local, cultural, traditional institutions to bring TPL up on board, but they refused. But the popular uh, uh, demand and riots across the nation pushed the TPLF out of Addis and they took the region as a final retreat. And uh, they uh, attacked, as you know, the Ethiopian defense force established there, but uh, the managed and well-controlled uh, law enforcement operation have been conducted, have been integrated region several times. I've stayed in my last visit a uh, few weeks back for around seven weeks. And uh, uh, there are major progresses unfolding in the region. Uh, the international community is also allowed to enter freely. The only thing what we require is email notification. There are more than eight media outlets that are now established in the region. And we have more than 195 UN and other non-governmental international organization functioning there. We have been working in a collaborative framework 
the partnership is a priority for Ethiopian government. We have signed at the earliest period a state-led partnership framework to oversee the humanitarian distribution, recovery, and other uh, processes as well. And also there are, in this engagement, there are some mishaps that are created. We need to amend and take necessary measures as a regard. Uh, uh, we have been conducting a regard to abuses and related matters, investigations, investigations of the four layer investigations, one by authority general office and uh, uh, federal police, uh, the human rights commission, the Ethiopian Human Commission, also is conducting an independent investigation to really what happened in this uh, areas where incidents of abuse occurred. And we Ethiopia also invited the United Nations to conduct a joint investigation on abuses uh, uh, by regard to the law enforcement operation. And that has already started. The United Nations and the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission uh, are now conducting investigations. And the Attorney General investigation has now been released. A brief information is now communicated to us, to the public at large. And we are seeing also uh, promising developments in that regard. But as you have said, uh, some of the issues, since the country is in a transition, as I said earlier, uh, from an authoritarian system towards a democracy, there are, of course, some confrontation and mishaps, but we have been uh, addressing this at multiple fronts and in collaboration with partners like the United States, USAID, and many other actors, including PACT, have been supporting in this regard. And now we are also planning to scale up the early warning system, not only to uh, areas mentioned by uh, respected Mr. Emmanuel, but also to areas that include the Tigray region. But in the Tigray region now, we are moved out of humanitarian focus towards a development uh, focused assistance. And the region has uh, had a lot of problems also prior to the law enforcement operation. More than 1.8 million people used to uh, get uh, handouts from the government, uh, and that exasperated the law enforcement operation. Uh, 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 as well as the locust infestation. And as you know, this is El Nino season in our part of the world. Uh, environment in this crisis also uh, is considered as a major catalyst for much of the problem we are experiencing. But I think the government in partnership with uh, local and uh, global partners is trying to address the problem and there are promising developments in this regard. But I think we have to verify uh, the what is uh, circulating in the social media and in some media outlets uh, even in the some UN agencies, we have been looking at uh, falsified informations which has not collaborated on the ground. And we want uh, know, uh, independent actors to verify this. So we are allowing media and other outlets to go and look into the information because we need also hope. A country in a transition has to have a hope rather than fear mongering and you know, always reporting on the damaging matters. But this is all I can say. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Abdi. Emil, are you back to your moderation role or do you want me to, to give me some, some heads up to, to conclude the, the session, please? Can you hear you well? Okay. Uh, I think we have come to the end of, I think we have come to we have come to the end of our, our session. We would wish to ask, continue to get more, more questions from you and, and uh, try to respond to that because we would need your feedback, we would need your, your critique and also your suggestions. But uh, if you don't take it as uh, something of self-serving, I would say, we are very much grateful for our partnership with Ministry of Peace and the security structures at the grassroots. So far, we think that we have forged a very exemplary partnership model and approach between the community, the CSO like us, civil society organizations, and the government. And we also hope and we are continuing to work with Ministry of Peace to scale up not only the technology, but the partnership model and myself, Dr. Abdi Negis from PACT, uh, NUL from PACT and Ministry of Peace would be available to answer more of your questions through email uh, from both the Ministry of Peace and the PACT's perspective in our endeavor to modernize the Ethiopian uh, complete early learning rapid response system. Thank you very much for support, for the opportunity. I want to thank our donors, the BUSA, Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, EU, and the U.S. said once more and appreciate my colleagues from ministry and, and PACT. Thank you. Thank you very much.